Today's show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company. Talkspace makes it easy to connect with a licensed therapist handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. Using Talkspace, you can text, audio, and video message your therapist and talk about your life, what's keeping you up at night, or even your annoying co- coworker. To sign up or to learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash watch. And to show your support for the podcast, use promo code watch to get $30 off your first month. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. Today's show is brought to you by Capital One's CreditWise app. Capital One created the CreditWise app so that you can check your credit score anytime you want right in the app. It's free to everyone, so download CreditWise today. Availability depends on presence of credit history from TransUnion. CreditWise is offered by Capital One Bank USA. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I'm an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, he still loves Paul Simon. It's Andy Greenwald! My friend, I'm in the room. I'm on the line. Oh, did I say on the other line? I'm sorry. That's because that's we've been we've been geographically <laughs> unfaithful. I, my my reference to Paul Simon there was a, a deep get on the mm-hmm. Los Lobos mythology that Paul Simon stole out of Graceland from Los Lobos. Not a lot of it, just just the myth of fingerprints, just track ten. <laughs> by the way, this is a fire way to begin a podcast about the year in music. Andy, this is the year in music. We're going to be joined by Lindsay Zolas from The Ringer in a little bit. We'll be talking about her best albums of the year. We're going to talk a little bit about our best albums of the year. But before we get into that, yeah, I know you wanted to tell listeners a little something about what you've been up to recently. Like Usher. This is my confession. Um, Yeah, I feel like I got to come clean about some stuff. So I um, how to how to to frame this. So, okay, so a bunch of people know um, some people know that before Grantland started, um, I was attempting to do some writing for television uh, in the creative sense. And when Grantland started and I had the opportunity to write about TV, I basically had to drop the other part. Because as a great as a great Ghostbuster once said, you don't cross the streams. So um, you know, I had four and a half terrific years um, writing about TV for Grandland, and that's probably why you know me at all and from this podcast. Um, when when Grandland ended, I was actually right before it ended, I was probably on my way out anyway, and um, was thinking about trying again on the creative side of the ball um, because that was an itch I still hadn't scratched, and it still meant a lot to me. And uh, I was curious about it, having learned a lot more about how the business worked. Um, so I was thinking about doing that. And then um, last fall, uh, when Grandland ended, I got an out of the blue phone call from Noah Hawley, the guy who um, makes Fargo. Um, and he asked me if I would come out to if I was interested in helping him work on some stuff. And my answer to that was yes. Now, I apologize that I have not been able to be completely forthcoming about this stuff. But the reason is that um, it wasn't my news to break. Uh, when you work on someone else's stuff uh, and you work in this industry, um, I can't be, I'm not the publicist. Um, so it's only now that I can confirm that um, the first thing that I worked on on TV as a writer uh, is coming out in February and it's called Legion. And I think hopefully some people have heard about it or seen the trailer and it's coming out on FX in February. Noah Hawley created. I was um, a very tiny part of it. Uh, I worked in the writer's room. Uh, my title on episodes two through eight is co-producer. And I had an amazing, amazing time doing it. And it's an incredibly fun and exciting and challenging thing. And so for people wondering why I haven't written any TV criticism since last fall, this is uh, that's the reason. Uh, That's why I'm not doing that anymore. Um, And the other stuff that I've worked on or I'm working on now, I will be able to talk about hopefully as soon as I can. But um, Chris knows about this. I do. Yeah. And uh, I guess I've been complicit in my silence. You are complicit. All our pals (laughs) at The Ringer know about it. and I think, and you know, Chris will step in to talk about it, but I am confident that it's actually in some ways going to make our podcast better. Um, I will disclose everything I can possibly disclose when that it's time to disclose That suggests that our it. podcast could be better. That's true. <laughs> I could be better. Yeah. You are always, always a thousand. Um, no, I, I, honestly, the perspective that I have now, I think, from just an appreciation for an understanding of how, how much work goes into making TV and what specifically it takes to make story... Um, I think it's going to help our podcast a lot in our perspective. But so anyway, so Legion is out in February. And I just want to reiterate again, my role in this, uh, I I was welcomed in with great generosity by people who have a lot more experience uh, than I do. Um, Whatever contributions I make were because of their um, goodwill and good ideas. Are you talking about the podcast or are you talking about the TV show Well, in general, (laughs) this is actually appropriate of everything that I do. But um, but anyway, I'm going to post something about this on Twitter just to say what's up. And then I'm going to go dark again. But... 
Um, but uh, this has been fun, and this is sort of what I'm doing now. So you guys might think that there, this this may bring up some conflicts of interest, and you are underestimating how delightfully awkward it's going to be yeah. if I savage anything I Andy works on. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> no, it is, seriously though, like uh, Andy and I, rem- like ultimately this this podcast is always from the perspective of fans um, and from the perspective of people who just really enjoy talking about popular culture today, and that doesn't change at all. And uh, seriously, like I. I I plan to watch Legion. I would have anyway, and I I, I plan to give some notes. <laughs> I, I I will take them happily. All I can say going forward is, I I did serve as the after show host for the television program Mr. Robot, and even Sam Esmail knows that I was <laughs> not reticent to voice my opinions about the second season of Mr. Robot. So it's very hard to keep one's opinions to oneself, especially when one has a microphone in one's face twice a week. So let's move on to the year of music. So yeah. we've got to we've got to get things done so we can get to Lindsay here. Um so one of the things I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this is like you and I both used to be in other lives, you and I used both used to be music critics. And something that I realized that was happening like around the mid early 2000s when I first started doing it really professionally um was the weight that usually was on your shoulders at the end of the year, mm-hmm. not only to feel like you would listen to everything, but also to have an opinion about everything that was relevant. And as the year end poll started, especially Paz and Jop at the Village Voice, which was kind of the critics uh, gathering point to like really sort of suss out what they thought was the best album, the best single of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, there would be this emergence of a genre called best album. Uh-huh. Um, like, so your personal tastes kind of went by the wayside and you got into this, Okay, so we're just talk. If we're only talking about these twenty five albums that sort of are in contention, so it was the split between best and favorite. Yeah, and I feel like this year. So the, this is a long way of saying that this year I just went with my favorites. That this year I feel like I there were a bunch of records that I recognize as being really important, and even even in my top ten, there are still some of those records are in there. But for my top ten this year, I real I just had like a you know kind of a come to Jesus moment about two weeks ago where I went through and listened to a bunch of stuff I hadn't heard, revisited some stuff that I had only listened to once or twice. And the list that I kind of came up with, which is honestly, and it always will be for me with this stuff, kind of arbitrary. Like I was making a 10 best movies list the other day and I was like, I don't really rate this over this. These are just my favorites. Yeah, I haven't seen 10 movies this year, so well, <laughs> I haven't flown a lot recently. Um, but with the music, I was like, you know, th- this is weird. Like I'll have Frank Ocean or Kanye in here that I think a lot of people are also going to be talking about. But then there are weirder, smaller records that just meant a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And um, that's always been something that I've grappled with at the end of years where I'm just like, I don't, I'm not trying to sound like Armand White. I just think Cymbals E Guitars is better than everything. Like I just liked it better than yeah. everything else. Um, so it's, it's been a funny process because I feel like when you're looking at a lot of the top 10 lists this year, you're seeing a lot of. Solange and Beyonce it's, and it, there's more Kanye consensus and, this year than almost any year yeah, I can remember. Yeah, and and Radiohead up at the top and um, David Bowie and Bowie Chance. Yeah. yeah, so there is a lot of consensus. But do you under you, you know what I'm talking about with that like yeah. best of the year as a genre? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, th- this year, you know, I, it it was a strange year for me because it, both when I was a music critic and before I was, when I was, and then after I was, this was this was kind of fun because I loved keeping a list of this stuff and I loved considering it and I always had an abundance of choices. I feel like this year I listened to more music than I did in the last few years, yeah. without question. Because of Spotify and stuff, or because just in general? I think because of Spotify, and then actually moving out here when you actually have a, you know, oh, listening to music car, in a car yeah. is still a pretty cool I thing to do as it turns culture out. podcasts. Do you really? Yeah. Just keep up on the voices in your head? <laughs> um, I... But yet, when it came time to make a list of albums, I really struggled. So I'd read a lot like about how the rise of streaming had made this sort of a post-album era. And I think we're going to talk to Lindsay about how that may no longer be the case, thanks to some really challenging hip-hop and R&B artists who pushed that envelope this year. But I definitely did not find uh, as many albums as I had in the past. Now, I'm gonna, I made a Spotify playlist of over 50 songs that I just think are amazing. And I like some of those songs more than the albums. But in terms of Albums that felt essential, that felt big, that felt like the best, that felt like they represented the year and in some way represented my experience listening to them, I struggled. Um, except for a couple examples. And we're going to talk about the big ones with each other and with with uh, with Lindsay. But I just want to shout out, like, the experience of listening to music is always the most subjective of any of any um, media. Like, when we talk about the TV shows that we like, um, you know, it, when we say, I don't know, we think Atlanta was the best show of the year. You know, I also like watching Top Chef in my private time, yeah. but I don't necessarily think of them in the same way. Whereas this year, Life of Pablo by Kanye and Coloring Book by Chance and The Tribe Called Quest record held equal place in my 
earphones right. in my imagination as this record by an artist called The Range, who was just a dude, like a DJ dude. We still call them DJ dudes. He made an album called Potential, where he just sourced samples from uh, YouTube clips of aspiring artists who hadn't made it. And he crafted this incredibly beautiful, moving, soaring, weirdly minimalist kind of funky record out of it. Without you. And to me, like that is that that defines this year almost as much as anything else. But that was an extremely private act. Same with um, and and just as a follow up, like this was a year of EPs for me. Mm. There's an artist called Hazel English from the Bay Area. I listened to her song "I'm Fine" more than almost any other song this year, particularly during the political season and the election. How it turns the- out, title's ironic. Is the rest of the EP good? The rest of the EP is tremendous shoegazy almost british inflected folk uh, british inflected uh like pop um but she's from the bay area um and what about what about your man vince staples he put out an ep he did and it's so good and it's, it's great. better because it's focused yeah so we ha- we actually had these shorter records um on par with the best albums which were in some cases extremely long yeah i mean for me the ones that were uh, we're going to talk with Lindsay largely about the sort of the, the, that, that best of genre I, the the smaller records are the other records that I really liked one was uh, Pretty Years by Symbols E Guitars I think probably the thing that I haven't taken that off the stereo in a couple weeks now um, I can't roll with dude's voice can I be uh, honest with you I like it but I don't <laughs> love on, it I let you have Hazel English I'm just, but, you, but you hadn't listened to that and I, you were like you were <laughs> I, I hate that kind of music, music though. I, no, we can be honest with each other. I like the second track on symbol on Symbols E Guitars is good. Yeah. Owns. I like that. I like Pine Grove a lot. You know, oh, I Pine really, Grove's really good. loved like the, that. Um and I liked a couple of like smaller well, rap records, like not smaller, but like I really, 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 really like 21 Savage. Young Savage, why you trapping so hard? Why do you nigga capping so hard? Um, that's in, t- tell me, just give me, give me the, give me the elevator. I listened to it, but give me the elevator pitch. Why that made your list? Like why that is something you just listen because to I don't think he sounds like anyone to me. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a very like what if future only rapped like this. And, <laughs> you're, you're not selling me on and, that. And uh, and then I also really liked. Uh, I mean, I think you you did too. Um, Blank face, the schoolboy oh, Q album, yes. which I think is actually my favorite rap album of the year as like a complete statement. Um, if, I don't, if, if Pablo you, has been dropping for me. Pablo we, has not been. Can I just say about schoolboy? If you distilled everything you and I liked about rap from the minute we met each other 20 years ago to today, it would probably be the part <laughs> when Jadakiss elbows his way into the track, like five minutes into uh, Groovy Tony yeah. on, on that schoolboy record. Exactly what I'm going to have when the cops come. Body language the same as when the shots run. Yeah. Hole in the 38 and a shotgun. Real nigga, we all know you are not one. Nah. It's so good. Pablo soars higher and higher for me. Yeah. Pa- Pablo Pablo is Twitter for me. Pablo's got like really great moments and really like kind of like forgettable moments. Here's what I think about Pablo. I think every every track on there is is pretty amazing and pretty fascinating. And at any moment could be my favorite song. Um and if you're saying if your counterpoint to that is what about the song about his sneakers? I just like the part where the Charlie Heat producer drop comes in, and I get that stuck in my no, head. No, I wasn't. I mean, my, I don't know. I think my counter is just that Pablo feels thin to me. Well, in the way that Twitter feels, like, like no, it just it 140 feels, yeah, character it's like, It feels like it's a, it's sketches now, like, and I think it has incredible moments. Like, I don't think that there's anything better in pop music in a long time than Father Stress My Hands yes. beat drop. Beautiful morning. But when then he starts rapping. Yeah, I wish he didn't do that. But here's here's we talk about Kanye too much on this podcast, and some people might listen to this in the morning and then they have to do the drinking game and then their whole days are shot. But looking over the list and 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 I think we're gonna talk about this with Lindsay too, like when I was when I was reaching to put other artists on my list, the only really rock representatives other than modern baseball, which by the way, that modern baseball album still owns for me. Um I put David Bowie on there. I put Paul Simon on there. Sorry, Los Lobos. Um, <laughs> I look at what Kanye did this year. Kanye is still the only one out there trying. And what I mean is he's trying to do everything. He's trying to be the rock stars that we used to have. And I and 
clearly to the detriment of his mental and physical and emotional health. So I worry about him. But the degree to which an album still matters to him, the degree to which winning Grammys, the degree to which owning the narrative, to being pushing himself to all limits, quote unquote, for us. And, you know, that's something that we saw when we saw the St. Pablo tour where he was we couldn't even see him. The spotlights were on his fans. I'm pretty moved by that in a year when so many other artists either uh, retreated, uh, traditional artists either retreated or felt inessential. Now, obviously, when I say that, I'm not talking about the ones that made our list. I'm not talking about Rihanna, who made, um, you know, probably the best album, quote unquote, album of her career. Beyonce, uh, Chance is certainly going for it. But I, there are so many other records I wanted to like, <laughs> Radiohead, <laughs> and uh, just they just they fell flat well, I, I find pablo like to be the most exciting and and inspiring record of the year and just the most compelling story um well we'll talk to Lindsay zolette about pablo and a bunch of other albums uh we'll just take a quick break from our sponsors and Lindsay will join us thanks hey guys i don't need to be the person to tell you this you probably already know a made to measure suit is much much better than when you're buying off the rack it fits you better it feels better you're more confident you're more excited frankly you look better in it um This is why I'm here to talk to you about Indochino. Indochino makes that kind of suit possible for the masses. You know how I know this? I have one. I went to Indochino back when I lived in New York, and I was treated so well by my man Moses there. He helped me pick out basically every single part of the suit. If I wanted to have an inside lapel of the American flag, he was going to do that for me. He raised his eyebrows, but he would have done it for me. Um, Indochino is one of the largest made-to-measure menswear brands. There are locations in many cities for you to check the stuff out in person. Once they have your sizes, then they have your sizes, man. Unless you just start eating a lot of carbs, you can just keep ordering clothes from them going forward. They make it so easy. Indochino makes it so easy for guys to get great-fitting, high-quality suits and shirts at an incredible price. So here's how it works. Visit Indochino.com or drop by one of the nine North American showrooms. There's one in New York. There's one in L.A. I bet there are others in major metropolitan areas, too. You pick from hundreds of fabrics and patterns. You choose your customizations from lapels, I say go with the American flag, to pleats, jacket linings, and more. Submit your body measurements. Submit to your body measurements, more like. Then you just kick back, relax, and get ready to step into the best, most stylish suit you've ever worn. It's just going to take four weeks. So this week, listeners of The Watch can get any premium Indochino suit for just three eighty nine at Indochino.com when entering WATCH at checkout. That's W-A-T-C-H. And that's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit. That's crazy. Shipping is free. I bet Chris didn't even know that. Chris hates paying shipping. That's Indochino.com, promo code WATCH for any premium suit, just $389 in free shipping. You will never, ever, ever have to worry about badly fitting suits or expensive trips to the tailor again. Get ready to look like a million bucks. You know what's cooler than looking like a million bucks? Looking like a billion bucks. Indochino. Hey guys, just want to tell you a little bit about Casper mattresses. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Mattresses can often cost over $1,500, but Casper mattresses cost $500 for a twin, $600 for a twin XL, $750 for a full, $850 for a queen, and $950 for a king. It combines springy latex and supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. An in-house team of engineers spent thousands of hours developing the Casper. Its breathable design helps you regulate your temperature through the night. Time Magazine named it one of the best inventions of 2015. You can try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to be spending a third of your life on it. Made in America, you get free shipping and returns in USA and Canada. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash watch and using offer code watch. Terms and conditions apply. Andy, now we are welcomed. We welcome, actually. We are not welcome. We welcome in uh, one of the Ringer's uh, pop culture critics and, and pop culture writers, Lindsay Zolatz, who's also DelVal native. Thank goodness. Let's keep it pure on this podcast. What's up, Lindsay? Hey, what's up? If, huh? if you guys could call me your holiness on this podcast. <laughs> oh, that's that right. Be, Lindsay is maybe as excited for really Young preferred. Pope as we are. Dude, you're yeah, coming back and next I've been month. waiting... <laughs> I've been waiting to make that joke literally for months. Can so. I can I can I it's do a really... quick Young Pope aside for you, Lindsay? I received of screeners of Young Pope, and I tried to fire it up the other night. The whole like a, like a family plan, just like <laughs> the wife and I were going to fire up the Young Pope, and she said, "What's this about?" And I said, "It's all there in the title." <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah. And we we turned it on, and the opening. I hope HBO isn't mad about this. Opening credit image is of a baby climbing on a mountain 
of other babies. And the babies might be alive <laughs> or they might be dolls. And my wife was like, nah. Are you saying that you have a theory about young Pope? No, I'm saying my <laughs> wife said, nah. My wife said, pass. <laughs> so you have not seen young Pope yet? No, I've seen the first 10 seconds of a crawling baby. And if that makes you more or less excited, that that's on you, audience and Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, we wanted to have you on because we wanted to talk about the year in albums. You wrote about this for The Ringer. And I thought it was really interesting because you were obviously grappling with the importance of the album as like a delivery system uh, for the music you love. And and you obviously thought that this year was a huge year for the album, in part because we kind of gave up on our preconceived notions of what the album should be. Right. Yeah, like it should not have been a great year for the album by so many counts like I we've heard a lot about how streaming is a lot more focused toward the single and even when we've been presented with albums before like listeners are kind of picking out certain songs that they want and that becoming the single so it was pretty unexpected just how great a year for albums this was and how like experimental and weird a lot of the biggest pop albums that we got were um you know obviously Frank Ocean Beyonce Chance putting out his like mixtape slash album Chance 3 <laughs> and Pablo and it just like the list goes on and I think a lot of it was a year where a lot of the weirdest and most experimental music um, coming out of these artists was like some from some of the biggest musicians and most popular um, you didn't even have to really go that far into like the indie sphere to find just really weird shit yeah so can, can I can I drop a theory on you and then I just I would love to hear your take on this. I'm ta- I'm, I'm just yeah. testing it out. This is a safe space for play. <laughs> um, in many ways, this year for me was my first post album year because I struggled making a top ten, but I had no trouble at all making over you know, a playlist of over fifty songs that, that I thought were just terrific. But I wonder if you agree with this theory, which is that if everything is cyclical, and I, Chris is nodding because Chris is a big believer in in just Westworld as applied to life. I'm just I'm staring at you like you're you're the young pope, but I'm James Cromwell. I am smoking the cigarette down to the filter. <laughs> um, if the last few years, like when streaming took off, people were saying, "Oh, now the music industry is returning to the way it used to be, like in the '50s and '60s, where everyone is a singles artist. It's a singles based um, industry, right?" I feel like this year was the beginning of late '60s, '70s when Albums were only worth listening to if they had something to say. When people cleared their throats, as the artists you mentioned did, and really went for it on the big screen, on the widescreen kind of canvas. Is that a correct assessment in your eyes? I mean, I like that. I hadn't thought of it that way before, but I think it's, we're kind of, like, I have thought about this as, like, the analogous to the beginning of the AOR era, but... Mm -hmm we tend to associate that more with like rock artists and particularly white male artists. And I think there's something going on where for the first time, like even when you're talking about the fifties and sixties, there was this kind of, and while the AOR stuff um, was going on, like there was that dichotomy where like pop was a singles game. Rock was like where the important statement Mm -hmm. album came out. And I think it's almost the opposite right now where you're getting these incredible statement pop albums um in this format that seem to be all but dying and becoming obsolete uh but is getting new life through you know artists that used to be considered single artists like i think rihanna is a perfect example of that like this anti is really the first like actual album that rihanna has made in terms of like it being something with a cohesive mood and that is more about the full arc of listening to it than just like a collection of singles. But also she had incredible success with a couple singles from that record. So I think you're seeing that become almost more the norm in the pop space where, whereas like, I mean, mean, the whole um, obsolescence of rock music in some sense is a whole nother conversation. But that to me was something that really... Um, was new about this year. Lindsay, I wanted to ask you about the idea of these albums and the releases as events as and also as surprise parties. Um, I thought that that kind of peaked and shattered with Frank over the course of those few weeks there with Endless and, and Blonde, where he kind of just had everybody on pins and needles waiting for this record that they had been anticipating for such a long time. And in my opinion, actually, I mean, Blonde more than lived up to that. But 
there was something sort of insane about the, you know, up at midnight watching uh, an Apple Music TV stream of a guy making a staircase as the way that we're in. The, I, I mean, I, it's not that much different than going to Tower Records at midnight on a for a release day 10 years ago. But I was wondering, this is sort of a two part question. How, where is your head at in terms of like the state of the surprise release or the event release? And then as a follow up, looking at your 10 best here. What is the record, not that you loved the most, but that you actually listened to the most from the moment it was surprise dropped to mm-hmm. a date, you know, unknown in the future? Yeah. Um, so Frank, first, I'll talk about, I, you know, I think in a lot of ways, Endless was sort of the anti-Lemonade or like the anti-visual album and that he really did just get us to stare at him making furniture in a <laughs> weird warehouse and like speculate on that. And it felt very trolly um, in an effective way, I think, because, you know, it's easy to forget now because the record was so good or the records, depending on how you want to define it. Um, but people were pissed <laughs> initially when it just seemed like, is this going to come out? Is is this all we've been waiting for? Like, is he just kind of pulling our leg? And I do remember just a bit of frustration from people when that was going on. But I think it, I mean, I think that Endless was more of the statement in terms of a surprise album than right. Blonde because it, it seemed to be, I don't know if he's confirmed this, but it seems like he was kind of just throwing something out there to like get out of his uh, album contract with Def Jam. And then he was able to re- release Blonde um through his own label so there was something like it was kind of a fuck you to just throw out this collection that kind of sounds like demos but it still is really good because it's frank ocean music and like even his demos are going to be better than um anybody else's album almost so that felt yeah there felt like something just in terms of the anticipation and how he was actively kind of trolling that um but then just sprung the bigger statement on us kind of out of nowhere the next day, which was Bond. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I personally am really sick of the whole surprise <laughs> album thing just <laughs> as a critic because on a very selfish note, um, I think it has changed the discourse around that a lot. For and sure. And been a nightmare for <laughs> people that are covering it. But I kind of, I don't necessarily think it's going to go anywhere, but I do think what you're going to see is like, artists doing more traditional releases like I think The Weeknd is kind of an example of that that there was a rollout for that record but it was way shorter than it would have been like three years ago you know we would have had three months of them teasing that album and I think he only announced it maybe like a month before and that still felt like a really long time in 2016 so I do think yeah yeah, yeah, and I think the window of that is good, is going to continue to shrink um, just for, you know, there's a cool factor to it. I think it, the surprise album is, like, the ultimate boast of, like, I don't really need to promote this because I'm so famous that people are going to buy it anyway. And, um, you know, so it doesn't work for every artist in that regard. Um, but, so your second question, I do think that, Life of Pablo was the thing I listened to the most. Yes. Um, I just kept returning to it. And I think it's one of those records that I cycled through about 10 different favorite songs on that throughout the year, which it's, you know, it's it's the kind of album that you can start at different points or, you know, the back half or if you start with the, the selection of tracks that he really did just tack on like the day before I came out with like 30 hours onward that's a whole different EP you know mood wise and um so I found myself really just putting that on when I had nothing else to listen to and I um as I have said elsewhere I'm a really nervous flyer and I had to go on some airplanes (laughs) this year and my new ritual is like listening to ultra light beam during takeoff (laughs) 
<laughs> that's beautiful. I truly that, feel that nothing can harm me. That is it once a song that makes me feel like nothing bad can happen to me and also would be a very appropriate song for falling out of the sky. I, my, my, exactly. My, no, that's the logic there. I, reminded, I would die to that song. I reminded myself this morning on the way in uh, on the 101 freeway that um, the way, you know, some actors need like to chop onions or whatever to like or, or think of the, their pet that died in order to get tears going. Yeah. I just have to listen to Chance just stroll onto the <laughs> stage and with his verse on that track. Um, yeah, I I mean, we're, we, we Chris and I talk about this all the time, but I, I mean, Pablo was I agree with you completely for any number of reasons. I think it was the best record of the year. But one of them is I love records that you are so packed with amazing digressive different types of quality that you forget the songs that are on it and you're almost surprised because it can hit you in a different way i mean records from like fleetwood max tusk to biggie's ready to die are just these overstuffed things and everything is good it's the hardest album to make and i think pablo is that um but speaking of these event records and surprise records Lindsay, you are a person of the world. You are a person of the internet. You you exist in culture. You have to you have to surf these various waves of culture as they come at you. You you mention how challenging it is to cover records that, that just drop out of nowhere. I'm curious, some of the albums that we were talking about as surprises are they weren't just surprises, they were also growers. Um the Frank record is probably like that. Um I'm still waiting for the Radiohead record to grow on me. Um <laughs> Even going Same. back, to, even going back. To, oh, good. Okay, we can talk about that in a second. Even, Slander. Yeah. Even going back to Kendrick last year, these are records that, even in the most ideal circumstances, require patience. And patience with culture is just not something that the current social media world is equipped to deal with. So, how, what's your process? How do you carve out time to actually engage with the records and treat them with the seriousness that they may, well, or may not, but may deserve? Yeah, it's tricky, and it's becoming trickier every year um but i do think it i mean it varies depending on the record for me and and kind of when my deadline is and how much i can successfully beg for a few more days to spend with an album um but i think with the frank record i spent about a weekend with it and for me i think when i'm reviewing something it's always the important part is to like listen to it in a few different contexts so i'll do the headphones listen like just in my nice headphones with nothing else going on and then I'll put it on in the background of something I'll take it on the subway I'll take it on a walk and so I think even when I have three weeks to write about something that's kind of how I test it out in the world so with the surprise album like I try to just do that really fast <laughs> in one day um, and get all those experiences in and see how the record sounds in that context but I agree it's it's kind of troubling um that because especially now a lot of the other issue with the surprise albums is like critics aren't getting them before the listeners are it's just everybody is hearing it at the same time and there's something really there is something democratic about that that you can be live tweeting it along with you know whatever music critic from x publication but there's yeah, I think a lot of these albums and the ones I talk about in the piece that were sort of out there and weird um, are growers. And Blonde didn't really grab me until maybe like the fourth listen. Um, I think there is a transcript on our Slack of me talking about how I hated it the first time <laughs> I listened to it. And now it's like, I think my second or third favorite album of the year. Like, yeah, I, I thought because really... I was going to ask you if there was anything that you were like, I was wrong. You know, like either I overrated I, this or. Yeah, well, that one, I, I like had my come to Jesus moment with it before my deadline, which was great. <laughs> and I was able to write pretty much a rave of it. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think if there's something I want, like a mea culpa on or I don't know. I, I do think um, like I'm curious if there's going to be more of a reaction of like criticism going back to stuff too. Um, I, when Pablo came out, I was still working at New York Magazine and sort of as a, as a trolley thing, but also had an actual idea to just, um, I re-reviewed Jesus instead of writing about Pablo <laughs> immediately, um, which I think my editors were okay with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> asked for permission and was just like, I'll have my review in a few days, but wanted to, uh, yeah, just 
almost make like a that. political statement about it, right? Yeah, a political statement about me being lazy and not wanting to write <laughs> really quickly on deadline. Um, but yeah, I think I'm interested in more discussion about that kind of stuff too. And now that it's like you're on time, people may be going back and rewriting about things that they ingested really quickly or, or allowing themselves to be wrong and to own up to that kind of stuff. And yeah, I think for me, like the blonde thing, I did turn around on it really quickly, but the first two times I was like, what has he done? <laughs> I don't understand this at all. Um, which, yeah, like you're saying, I think is often the mark of a really great album. Yeah, when it emerges to you, yeah. new, is good in like a new way that your ears almost have to adjust to it the first couple of times. And that's absolutely how I felt about Frank. Um, so I think, yeah, that's my one worry that we're not building in that time as much as listeners. But I also think the albums that came out this year and how challenging a lot of the big pop albums were shows that like that's not making the artist shy away from making challenging and and difficult music so looking over your top 10 list which everyone should do it's on the ringer.com um there's a lot of overlap with my list there's a lot of overlap with chris chris's list and i feel like and I'm, i'm intuiting here that there may have been some similar thinking i'd love to to hear your take on it which is that as you said earlier, the most challenging, the most interesting, the most demanding, not in terms of difficulty in listening to them, although that's part of it, but in terms of demanding your attention records came from the hip hop and R&B world. You have Beyonce, Solange, Frank Ocean, Kanye, Tribe Called Quest, which I just, I still can't get over that record. If it came out a month earlier, maybe even higher on my list, uh, Rihanna and Chance. And then you sort of got the, this, you, I feel like you ran into the same problem I did, which is when it came time to represent you know, for my own people, the white male artist. <laughs> you put you got Leonard Cohen on there. I put Paul Simon and David Bowie on my list. Like Lin- the theme of Lindsay's the, work this year has definitely been defend white men. I think well, the internet in general is that's actually yeah. the theme of it. And thank good job by you, Internet. Um <laughs> good job, America. But in terms of finding records that really resonated, I was shocked at that the older art artists that somehow elbowed their way on there. And then you had Mitski uh, at the bottom of your list. So did you go through, did you, did you actually like try to rack your brain to find a rock record to put on this list? I mean, it just felt so deeply inessential. I was trying to talk myself into, um, Joyce Manor, you know, which is a pop punk record that I love, but I don't love it as much as these other records. I wouldn't even put it on the same list. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, so I will say Bowie was my number 11. I have like the bottom half of my top 20 list that I can post somewhere too. Cause I, got you know you get all manners of like um horrific mentions when you do any kind of list so of a lot of people are like oh how do you put such and such over david bowie he died and it's like <laughs> chill i got it <laughs> got it on there um yeah but i think i don't think i was straining to find what like i did really i think angel olsen that record is terrific right. and i guess you could consider that a rock record although she's such an interesting hybrid of like folk and um, country and pop and there's all sorts of stuff going on there but yeah it just felt I'm wondering if it was a year where because of just the weird vibes in the country the depressing political climate you know just the the unending sense of dread <laughs> hovering over us the entire time that there was something really cathartic in the fact that a lot of us were listening to the same music and enjoying the same music. And it did feel like a year where I was reaching to kind of the obscure corners of my listening habits a lot less. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I do think it was a year where we were looking for some sort of collectivity and consensus because we weren't finding it um, in the political moment so like if we could find it at the very least in music and in art i do think it was a year that yeah like it was great to agree with so many people that lemonade was a really good and important and just artistically visionary statement um but yeah I, I found i did find that in my listening that i was not kind of looking to the indie rock world as much because I don't even know that that feels like an alternative anymore. You yeah. know, like I think when you get a record as weird and as popular as Coloring Book or even as Pablo, um, you know, I think that satisfied a lot of the things I used to look for 
in more like out there music. You're getting that in in pop. I, I agree with that completely. Lindsay, we're going to wrap up there, but thank you so much for joining us. Send us your bottom 10 list there so we can put it up with uh, with everything else. Because and, and your mentions aren't lit enough. And everyone will get mad at you for what's not in the top 20, and you'll have to do the next 10. So it never ends. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much for joining My us, My number Lindsay. 21 will be lit. <laughs> yeah. Talk to you soon. All right, bye. Thanks for listening to The Watch today. Uh, We'll be back on Thursday with a very special episode with a guest to talk about the best TV of the year. Yeah, great job, Baranski. Thanks, man. Support from The Watch comes from Talkspace, the online therapy company that believes that therapy should be affordable, confidential, and convenient. Join over 500,000 people who have used Talkspace for online therapy with their licensed therapist. For a special offer, visit Talkspace.com slash watch. Again, that's T-A-L-K-S-P-A-C-E dot com slash watch. Matt Damon returns to his iconic role in Jason Bourne, now available on 4K Ultra HD and Blu-ray. Experience Jason Bourne in DTSX technology for the most immersive, lifelike audio experience available at home. Join Matt Damon for the next chapter in Universal Pictures' Bourne franchise, which finds the CIA's lethal former operative drawn out of the shadows. Get it on 4K Ultra HD and Blu-ray with DTSX sound today. Rated PG-13.